everybody to the Petaluma Museum. I'm Joe Noriel, the museum president. What an amazing exhibit. I mean, uh, if that doesn't say it all, just from walking around in these incredible artifacts and, and treasures. Uh, just recently from the uh, United States Congress, I'm going to read this to you quickly. A certificate of special congressional recognition presented to the Petaluma Historical Museum for Roma crossing the borders, celebrating over a century of Romani hit contributions in art, music, and culture, signed by Lynn Wolsey. So um, amazing. wonderful to be recognized for this very important exhibit and we certainly are trying to learn all we can about this very unique and precious culture and none of this would be possible without two people and I wanted to introduce them right now who will introduce our distinguished speaker today uh, and that's Shani Rafani from The Voice of Roma and uh, Mark Tomlinson. And uh, I'll break you into the English accent 
that you may have to understand a little bit of later. Anyway, so thank you very much for coming. And uh, let me introduce Professor Hancock, uh, probably the world leading authority on the Roma and uh, former representative of the United Nations. So, the floor is yours. Thanks, and uh, Ian, thank you so much for uh, your amazing work because, uh, uh, hi everyone, my name is Shami, uh, uh, president of Voice of Rama, a non-profit organization. When I came in America uh, in 1993, uh, Everybody was thinking about the gypsies as the wanderers, how beautiful it is to be free and wandering around. And then uh, I was like, coming from Europe, we strongly prefer to be called Roma. And uh, when I got to read uh, Ian Hancock's uh, literature, it really kind of made so much sense. And so all what you see around us, it's really thanks to this woman, uh, uh, to this man. <laughs> who really introduced me uh, to my own culture without knowing so much about, because there is not so much written record about the Romani history and culture. And then when I started to read Ian Hancock, it kind of made so much sense. So without further ado, here, Mr. Ian, Ian Hancock. Well, Mark made that comment about paving the way for a, a British accent, but I've, I've lived long enough in this country that I can switch back and forth. <laughs> and I teach in Texas, and when I talk to my students, I talk like that. <laughs> but when I go out to London, I talk like that. <laughs> um, Shani uh, referred to the popular image of the gypsy, and, and that's the theme of what I want to talk about today, because that's the image and that's the word that most people are familiar with. If you look at, um, some of you, maybe not, not that old, but uh, our parents at least, for some of you, before TV, before radio, when families would uh, sit around the piano and sing songs to, to pass the time back in the early part of the last century and would buy sheet music and uh, we have, I, I uh, run the uh, Romani Archives and Documentation Center which is a huge repository in Texas and we have a, a huge collection of sheet music and uh, I didn't bring the originals, they're getting sort of fragile, but I've photocopied some to show you. And um, they, they paint a picture. This one, my little gypsy wander, because she wanders around. Um, the little gypsy tea room. And look at the images that accompany the song sheets. In each case, well, here's a, she's holding a tambourine, that's part of the image. Here, a teacup with the tea leaves telling fortunes, and, a, and bandana and earrings, so you usually get that. It's the gypsy in me, right? Bandana and earrings, and a swag on a stick. Play to me, Gypsy, the song I love. There's a wagon over here. I recall a Gypsy woman, cowboy song. <laughs> the Gypsies are coming. Same general dress, appearance. This one's quite pretty. Uh, Rosaza, here she has the tambourine and exotic looking 
Another one, another tambourine, gypsy dream rose, bandana, earring, the works. I love you, gypsy. Wagon. I guess a guitar. Campfire. My little rose of Romani. And it goes on and on. We got loads of this. I just couldn't bring it all. Um, we do have rose and we do have wanda. But mostly the female image is just gypsy. Not wanda or rose or Gladys or Mary, but gypsy. So it's an image. It, it represents something, not an actual individual woman, but a representation. Um, here's another one. It's just called the Gypsy, but this is actually from some lurid uh, publication that I, I won't elaborate upon. Um, in addition to these old sheet music uh, scores, there are all sorts of books. This one's called the Gypsy Chronicles. These are all very recent. Gypsy Chronicles, and some of the uh, blurb on the back, I'll read some of it. Upon each matrimonial bed that Sigani de Torres makes, he bestows a potent charm, one that guarantees a lifetime of pleasurable lovemaking. His wife, Kitana, is a matchmaker. Uh, the Gypsy Chronicles is a bedtime story for grown-ups. <laughs> okay, here's one. Gypsy Heart, Sasha White's book, Gypsy Heart. These are all really new. I mean, one, two years old. The back of the book says, Ms. White has written an intensely sensual book with Gypsy Heart. Uh, can a man bent on settling down convince a free-spirited woman uh, that doesn't believe in happily ever after to risk her gypsy heart. Uh, warning, this book contains explicit sex explained in graphic detail with contemporary language. Okay, Shiloh Walker, Touch of Gypsy Fire. Okay. The half-breed daughter of an elvish prince and a gypsy lady She'd heard it said that a match between an angel and an incubus was better suited uh, until Aaron, the powerful, sinfully seductive, I can't even read this stuff. It's <laughs> yeah, Adventure, sex, romance, a touch of gypsy fire will cast its charmed spell over you. Okay, a couple more. Gypsies, tramps, and heat. That, of course, is a play on that old Cher song, Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves. Uh, Gypsies, Tramps, and the Heat, what does it tell us about this book? Get swept off your feet by a sinfully handsome movie star and a magic spell. Lose yourself in the dark eyes and crystal ball of a gypsy lover. This is quite an old one. This is pa Paprika, the Gypsy Trollop. Notice what she looks like, a blonde, white lady, but she is a trollop, and uh, what does it say about this? All the wild passions and secret earthy customs of the gypsy are faithfully delineated in this colorful masterpiece. Uh, it goes on. Before she was 15, her tribesmen were fighting over her as dogs fight for a bone. <laughs> okay, I think I've made a point here. But what I want to do is contrast this sort of stuff with books, other books, that have come out in the past five, ten years, such as the Romani voice in world politics. Roma in Europe from social exclusion to active participation. The Romani movement, minority politics and ethnic mobilization. 
Human Rights of Roma and Travelers in Europe, Minority Rights and Protection in International Law, the Roma of Europe, Romani Politics in Contemporary Europe, Poverty, Ethnic Mobilization, and the Neoliberal Order. And again, I've only brought a few because of space and weight. But look how different. I'm going to put these down. Here. And don't forget this one. We are the Romani people by the <laughs> Well, actually, since we're um, touting my book, there's one even more recent called Danger Educated Gypsy. <laughs> um, but why is there this huge discrepancy between gypsy, in quotes, and Roma. It's, it's as though there are two completely different personas, and in fact, there are. And the gypsy image is so deeply entrenched in the popular perception that it completely blocks our effort First of all, to be taken seriously as an actual people, but secondly, to uh, have our real identity recognized and respected. So what I want to do is uh, talk a bit about where, where, why there are these two identities. Where could it possibly come from? And then say something about who we actually are and where we actually originate. I'll give you a bit of a background. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you where, where we come from first and then lead into how, how it took two different directions. Roma, which is the word I'm going to use, showed up in Europe in the early middle part of the Middle Ages, maybe around 1300. And the, they had come in across from Asia, from that part of the world called Anatolia, which is mostly Turkey today, crossed over into Europe, and the Europeans really weren't sure who these people were. We're talking about few centuries ago. So those people, first of all, looked a lot more different from what they look like today, darker, more Eastern looking, speaking a language spoken nowhere in Europe, an Asian language. And the Europeans, we know that Europeans were curious and they asked these people, who are you, where are you from? And some of them were able to say actually where they were from. But that never became part of the general understanding. And it became lost. Who these people were became lost, not only in the European memory, but in the Romani memory too. And that's important because our ancestors themselves forgot where they come from. Once that happens, of course, outsiders can come up with any suggestion, all sorts of guesses. And there were all sorts of really bizarre guesses um, that they were... Uh, a, a popular one was that Roma were Jews. Jews who had gone underground during the medieval pogroms and had, because they'd been under, in the caves and in the forests, had become kind of ingrained with dirt and that's why they were dark-skinned. Um, another one was that they had come actually from out of the hollow earth, inside the hollow earth. Another one was that they had come down from the moon a lot of these very peculiar suggestions. And the name, we call ourselves Roma, but it's only now that we're being called Roma from outside. The names that were applied to us are the ones that have stuck. And there were two of these in particular. One was Egyptian, 
and that has given a gypsian gypsy that's where gypsy comes from a gitano gitano in spanish and so on um, another one was uh, atzingani this was a name it's a greek word from the byzantine period the anatolian period which means roughly don't touch and it was a a nickname given to a different group of people uh, a, a Christian sect called the Manichaeans, who, uh, they were a very important Christian group at one time, they kind of disappeared over time, but they, they played a big part in the establishment of Christianity, but they were very exclusive, exclusive in the sense of excluding non-members, and so they got this nickname of the don't touch people, you can't get friendly with them, you know. And Brahmani behavior is like that. I'll, I'll explain it as we go. But uh, in, in our culture, we don't encourage too much intimacy with non-Romani people. And since that was observed, that same nickname of the hands-off people, the don't-touch people, stuck. And Atsingani has given Tsigan, Tsigoina, and a whole host of other labels um, which actually are not the right words. We, we are Roma. The revelation that we had come from Asia came sort of by accident in the middle of the 18th century in and this is the story, this, this at least is the conventional story, which goes that in 1760, a Hungarian theology student who attended the University of Leiden was one day in the student's common room, and there were three students from India. And his family, this is back in the time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his family uh, was quite wealthy and employed a lot of Roma as laborers. And he would hang out with them in a town, it was called Rab back then, now it's called Kjör. And he had picked up some of our language from those people. And on this particular day, he's at the university in the students' union and he sits down with these three students from India. Because back then, and even until now, the University of Leiden has uh, an exchange agreement with India. Three Indian students come to Holland, and three Dutch students go to India to complete their graduate studies. So he sits with these Indian students, and they're discussing something or other, and he's recognizing a lot of the words they're using because he knew Romani. And so he got them to write down a thousand words in their Indian language. And the next time he went back home, he took the list to the Rama that he knew. And according to the story, they understood every single one with ease. Well, that's a huge exaggeration. But something like that must have happened. I actually chased this down. I went to Leiden, I checked out the records from 1760 and so on. There's no record of this guy ever having been there. And it's a bit of a mystery. But something must have happened. We've never found that list of a thousand words. It's only been written about. But something must have happened. Because as the story goes, and it appeared in the Vienna Gazette. He passed this information along to somebody else who then passed it along to uh, the editor of the Vienna Gazette. And it finally got into print in 1776. So 16 years before it got into print. And once that happened, there was 
tremendous interest because we're in the period of the Enlightenment and a lot of academic areas are beginning to emerge, including linguistics. And if you know anything about philology and linguistics, the, the early interest was in the so-called classical languages, Greek and Latin and Sanskrit. And the study of Sanskrit was central to the early beginnings of, of, of linguistics. And here was a population on the very fringes of European society, at the very bottom, speaking a language descended from this noble Sanskrit language, which was kind of an anomaly. And so a number of scholars, European scholars, most of them German, um, thought to themselves, well, if they speak an Indian language, they must be from India. And that, that's a dangerous assumption, of course. Specific languages are not passed genetically. They're passed socially. And when I tell my students about this, I, I make the point that I have students who are native speakers of English, whose ancestors may have been African or Chinese or Mexican, but they're native speakers of English. And on that basis, I cannot assume that they're Anglo-Saxons. But back then, the idea was, well, if you speak an Indian language, you must be Indian. As it turns out, they were right. But having started uh, this, this line of pursuit, the questions were, OK, if these Sigoina are Indian, what are they doing in Europe? When did they leave? Why did they leave? Do they have a country? All these sorts of questions. And the first full-length book about Roma was by somebody called Grellman. It came out in 1784. And in it, he, and it was a very racist book, very, uh, very negative in his description of, of the Roma, but he he said, well, if we um, look at Roma today in Europe, or Zigoina, this is the German word, uh, they are so poor and shunned and marginalized, and they do all the crappy jobs, and they, they play music on street corners and so on. This is what they must have done in India. So they must have come from the lowest caste in the Indian caste system, which would be Shudra. And this was the assumption. And as we get into the 1800s, um, there's more discussion about this. And in 1829, an English uh, army man called uh, Colonel John Harriet wrote uh, an article in a journal where he claimed to have discovered the answer to who the gypsies were. And that's the word he used, English. He said the story of what the gypsies are doing in the West is in the a history of Persia, a book written in the 11th century called the Book of Kings. And in the Book of Kings, there's a story uh, about an episode that took place in the 5th century when the, so the son-in-law of the Shah of Persia visited his father-in-law. He was from India, but he was visiting his father-in-law in Persia and noticed that the Persian subjects all looked miserable so he said, when I go back to India, I'm going to send you a gift of 10,000 musicians to cheer up your subjects. <laughs> and evidently this happened because the same story turns up in, in about four different independent places. A couple of them say 10,000 musicians, a couple of them say 12,000 musicians. But we can assume that something like that must have happened. 
But Harriet took it a bit further. He said, now, here we've got uh, evidence that a whole lot of Indians left India, India at one time, came west into Persia, and they were musicians. And look, a lot of the gypsies in Europe are musicians. And there's nothing in the Book of Kings to say that they ever went back to India. In fact, the story goes that after one year, the Shah, Shangal of Persia, um, got tired of him and just told him to go away. And that was the end of the story in the Book of Kings, the Shah Naman. And so uh, Harriet says, well, they must have just kept coming west and then they all came into Europe. And that became the established story. And to this day, it gets repeated. I have a, a book for children about gypsies uh, that came out two years ago from an American publisher, and it repeats this story. Well, in recent times, there have arisen, if you like, Romani people who have become educated in the Western way and who have become historians and linguists and who grew up speaking our language and who have re-examined the details of our history. And the picture that we have is very different. What we know is, well, let me tell you how we did it. It's like a detective story. The language that we speak <coughs> is an Indian language. There's no Indian language in India that's quite like it. If we look at our language, it's certainly Indian, but it has features from several different Indian languages. Even in our numbers, when we count up to 10, there are four different Indian languages represented, even in just counting up. That points to a mixed population, not a single population. If we look at the kinds of words in the language, there are quite a lot of words having to do with warfare. The word for soldier, the word for prisoners of, of war, the word for spear, dagger, uh, setting up camp, taking down camp, um, all kinds of military words. And these are Indian words. That's important. Because if you look at our Romani language, a good metaphor for it is an onion. If you think of an onion as being built up layer upon layer, that's what the language is like. The heart of it is Indian. But then there's a layer of Persian. Then there's a layer of Armenian. Then there's a layer of Greek. And then there's a layer of this, that, and the other. And each layer represents a move through space, geographically, and encountering other people and picking up new words as you go along. So that's very handy. But if we look at the Indian words, obviously these were there to start with. They weren't picked up later. It means then that the military words were there from the beginning, which means the people were military from the beginning. Now, if we look at changes that languages go through over time, just like English, for example, uh, if any of you have done English history, you know there was Old English, like Beowulf, right? Then there was Middle English, like Chaucer, and now we speak modern English. Um, if you know anything about Romance languages, you know that French and Italian and so on, Spanish, come out of Latin over time. And you also know that 
Latin. Anybody done any Latin? Not recently. <laughs> Anybody High know school. any German? Years ago. Okay, you know, you know that lots of languages have gender, so you have masculine and feminine. And you know that some languages have three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. German does, Russian does, Latin did. But if you know that about Latin, and you know that the languages that have come out of Latin, like French and Spanish and Italian, only have two genders, right? They lost the third gender, the neuter. Well, Indian languages had three genders, but then when they got into the new Indian languages, they lost the neuter gender. And that happened around the year 1000. Romani only has two genders. If it had three, it would have had to leave. Then we could say maybe the, the, the Persian story about the musicians may be right, because fifth century, certainly, three genders. But Romani only has two. So it must have left somewhere after about the year 1000. But then, the first evidence of Roma in Europe is around 1250, 1300. So now we've got this little window in time to account for. Leaving India around 1000, showing up in Europe around 1300, what's happening in between? How do we get from there to there? That means, okay, we've got a time. Now we've also got this military aspect. So the next thing we did, it was a small group of us, what is going on in India around the year 1000 that's military, that would have brought lots of different Indian languages together? And we find right away that there were a number of raids there were about 17 raids over a, about a 25-year period of time from somebody called Mahmud of Ghazni, Mohammed of Ghazni. Uh, Ghazni, Ghazna, this is in uh, Afghanistan today, city. But there was a huge empire called the Ghaznavid Empire, roughly where Afghanistan is trying to expand, and it was being led by Mohammed, and he was moving eastwards into India, trying to spread his empire, but he was also moving westwards into Persia, trying to uh, expand that way. And uh, on the eastern side, he was fighting the Hindus. There was no single India at that time, but lots of different areas with different kings. And the Indian response was to assemble armies to try and stop the spread of the Ghaznavids. And uh, these people were assembled in different military camps, army camps, and um, the the general language of the Indian military was Persian. It wasn't any single Indian language. There were lots of them, but they, they used Persian as the administrative language. Those encounters with the Hindus were almost all defeats for the Indians. Either they were killed in huge numbers or taken prisoner, their temples burned down, taken prisoner. It wasn't just soldiers, that's important too. The soldiers, many were uh, called Rajputs, um, were all men, of course. But even more than they were soldiers were camp followers. And the camp followers were men and women, and their job was to look after the warriors and feed them and dress their wounds and uh, prepare the battlefield, set up the tents, mend the broken weapons and all of that. On the western front of the Ghaznavid Empire, they were 
fighting another population called the Seljuks, also Muslims, but enemies of the Ghaznavids. They were trying to spread their empire in that direction. The Hindu prisoners of war allied themselves with the Seljuk prisoners of war, and together they were able to defeat their captors. This happened in 1038, and that was the end of Muhammad of Ghazni. Then the Seljuks, together with the Indians, moved up and took over the kingdom of Armenia. That happened in 1071. Well, Armenia was at the eastern end of Anatolia, and the Seljuks established their own sultanate, the Sultanate of Rum, R-U-M, which was um, allied with the Byzantine Empire. Now, the Byzantine Empire was the eastern empire, eastern province, if you like, of the Roman Empire. And it was Christian, and the general language was Greek. And this is where this mixed population of Indians kind of came to rest for a couple of hundred years. And during that period of time, through intermarriage with each other and with surrounding Greeks and Armenians and, and others, Kurds and, and different populations, gradually crystallized into an ethnic population. Up until this time, it was a disparate population identified by profession, really, but now being settled. And, and what happens with Indians overseas is that the fact of being Indian outside of India becomes more important than caste differences, which in India may prevent you from marrying out of your caste. But if you look at uh, Indian populations here in this country, in Fiji, Mauritius, East Africa, people who would, whose families would never have married while in India marry now because, after all, we're all Indian, right? So we start to get a Romani population taking shape and at the same time the Romani language becoming a native language. If we look, and this is what we understand now, if you look at the Romani language, it's never been spoken in India. That's, that's interesting. It's an Indian language that was never spoken in India. We are an Indian people who didn't exist in India, but our genetic makeup is clearly Indian. Even a thousand years later, we all have it. But if you look at the breakdown of the different dialects, there seems to be three major big dialect groups in Europe. An early one, a middle one, and a later one. And the early one is represented by Romani populations that are around the fringes of Europe. Obviously, they're the ones who went furthest. They went right to the coastlines. So up through Scandinavia, through the British Isles, down through uh, Spain, and even in the southern Balkans and parts of Italy, you, there are dialects of our language which are the earliest kinds of Romani. Then we get a, a bit later, which are spoken in the central area, in uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, parts of Hungary. Then we get a later one, which is distinctive in that it seems to have originated with the move of the Ottoman Turks westward into Europe. Once again, a move initiated by this expansion of Islam out of India because of the eastward movement of the Ghaznavids into Europe 
because of the Western movement of the uh, Ottoman Turks. And when the Ottomans took over the Byzantine Empire and kept on coming up into the Balkans, bringing Islam and the Turkish language with them, they brought Roma also. And it's interesting that those Roma that came with them were contingents of the Ottoman armies. So that military connection was still there. When the, uh, they showed up, the Europeans at first of all thought that the Roma must be Turks. But then they realized, well, they don't look like Turks. They're not speaking Turkish. They're not Muslims. We're not sure what they are. Egyptians, something. But whatever they were considered to be, they were pretty quickly made slaves. And that's significant. That third migration into Europe became enslaved in Turkish-occupied Europe, which during the, that early period uh, consisted of the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia, which today is Romania, and they became slaves. We have uh, documents, uh, bills of sale for Romani slaves from the 1300s, and they were kept there. Uh, that slavery lasted until about 1860, very long time, and it was pretty uh, horrible slavery, and it hasn't been a part of the uh, history books, but um, it's, uh, if, you, if you get my book, there's a chapter in there on it, but I have an earlier book that is out of print, but you can um, download it. The whole thing is digitized. You can download it uh, off of the web. It's called the Pariah Syndrome, and it's a much more detailed study of that slavery. Um, <clears throat> those, that third wave group are the ancestors of the largest Romani population in North and South America. When, they were, when slavery was abolished in Europe at that time, there was a, a scramble to get away from slave-holding parts of Europe. Those who were closest to the eastern border, which is to say Russia, Ukraine, crossed over and went up that way. Those who were closer to the western border came over into Serbia or went into Greece. And kept coming to the Americas. And so most Romani Americans descend from that we call Vlach, because of Vlachia, Vlach population. But they certainly weren't the first ones coming to the Americas. The earliest record we have of a Romani presence in America is of three Roma on Columbus's second voyage in 1498. They were not willing emigrants, they were being transported because the uh, Western Europeans wanted to get rid of, of Roma any way possible. In Eastern Europe there was slavery, in Western Europe there were the overseas colonies and so Roma were being shipped off uh, and the, the history of Roma in um, North and South America is quite interesting, being sent here by the English, the Scottish, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, um, just goes on. So that's, that is what we understand now of our history, and, and there are some interesting and important aspects resulting from this new understanding that give us uh, an insight into what the situation is for Roma. First of all, our identity as a people happened in Anatolia, 
Well, geographically, it's on the Asian side, but culturally, it was the West. Remember, it was Christian, it was Greek-speaking. So our identity as a people happened on the doorstep of the West. So we are an Asian people. Our culture, and I'll say a bit about that, our language, our bloodline is Asian. <coughs> but we're Western. So that is a problem right there. And this is important for national administrations, governments, to understand that. And they don't understand that. And the reason they have so much of a problem trying to assimilate us, not, uh, which is what they want to do. We don't particularly want to be assimilated, but we like to be integrated. And there is a difference. But until they understand that there are deep-rooted cultural and linguistic differences, ways of thinking between Roma and what we call Gaje, which is non-Roma, um, then they're never going to be able to accommodate us in a, in a fair way. So that's one thing. It's like a square, square peg in a round hole. The other thing is that as we were taking shape as a people, we were also splitting up and leaving. So we didn't complete our, the formation of our, de our identity in one place and then start to move out. We started to leave as it was happening, which means that if we've got the first move into Europe happening, let's say, in. Um, 1200 even, and the last one happening in 13 or 1400, that's a lot of time between, and if one group ends up in Russia and another one ends up in Spain, that's hundreds and hundreds of miles, and they've been apart for hundreds and hundreds of years, so there's no, we do not have a sense of one single identity. Some of us who are politically active want to see that, and we talk about unification. I used to talk about reunification, but that was idealistic. We, we cannot be reunified if we were never unified to start with, but we can certainly be unified. But before we can accomplish that, we have to know who we are and where we come from. And the fact is, most Roma still don't know that. And because we don't know it, we're not able to tell the non-Romani world exactly who we are, which allows them to play with our identity and call us whatever they want and <coughs> transfer fantasy onto us. And that brings me back to where does all of this stuff come from, these gypsies, tramps, and heat, and so on. And to explain that, we have to go back to this same period of the Enlightenment, around the same time that this breakthrough happened with the Indian connection. This was also when the Industrial Revolution started. The Industrial Revolution rested on the invention of internal combustion engines, steam engines, and so on, which of course required fuel, coal, and put a lot of people out of work. And it created an underclass, a social underclass, agricultural, becoming urban, and, and so on. And Western countries began to change. They became, especially the cities, uh, let's think of London, for example, in 1830, 1840, grim and dirty, kids being sent down coal mines, and, and there was a, a longing for a lost rural time. And you can get a picture of how bleak it was, if you read Charles Dickens, for example. Um, but if you look at the poetry and the art from
from that period. It's all shepherdesses and meadows and fields and so on. And the gypsies came to represent the children of nature who had not been affected by industrialization. At the same time that this sort of uh, association was happening, racism was happening too. And that was the result of colonization overseas, the, the oppression of non-white populations by white populations, and the fear of race mixing, and the idea of pure races and mixed races, and the dangers of mixed race. Part of that danger was political too. There was a fear that um, if there were colonized people who had some white in them, they might get above their station and want to take over. That was a real fear. And so the idea of pure races and the pure gypsy, called the true Romani in the English tradition. And the true Romani was dark brown, black eyes, black hair, lived in a wagon, stole a chicken or two, ate nuts and berries, played a guitar, got into mischief a little bit, but really didn't do anything terrible. Sort of a lovable rogue, romantic, free, very free, free from nine to five routine, free from hygiene, all right? Free from moral restrictions. All of this stuff was transferred to this image which was being bolstered in literature. And there are a couple of writers from this period, one in particular, somebody called George Borrow, wrote a number of books in the middle of the 1800s that reinforced this image of the true Romani. Of course, after all these centuries, there are no Roma anywhere in the world, and there's about 12 million of us, there are no Roma who are of unmixed Indian descent. No way. Which means all Roma are mixed. It's just a matter of how mixed. Most of the Romani population in the British Isles is mixed, especially. For one thing, the British Isles are separate from the rest of Europe. And so it's been sort of self-contained and mixed more with the local population. So there's more white in the Romani population who actually are the Romani population, but it, the, the racist attitudes allowed the government and, and the church and so on to say, well, these people are not really gypsies. They're kind of half-breed mongrels, and we don't have to worry about them. The, the true gypsy lives out in the woods, and, and you never see him anyway, but he's the romantic character. And that's that's still there, this attitude is still there. And while this literary gypsy was taking shape, the actual Romani population didn't know it was happening. They didn't go to school. They didn't read and write. They weren't in a position to challenge it and say, no, that's not us. You're, you've made up an image. This is who we really are. Nobody said that. And it's actually only now that we are doing that and saying, no, you cannot keep calling us what you call us, even today. This is insulting. You could say, well, it's just fun. And sure, but when you watch these TV shows about the mafia and crime bosses and godfathers and so on, you know at the same time, they don't represent all Italians. You learn about Botticelli and Michelangelo, and you know what Italians have given the world, and you know that the mafia image is, is kind of a fiction. I mean, there are mafiosi, for sure, but that has been exploited for entertainment, really. The difference is that People know about gypsies, they don't know so much about Roma. 
So what we want to do is say, okay, love your Esmeralda, love your Carmen, but understand that those are creations by non-Roma. They are not us. And if you want to know about us, now's your chance to ask some questions, which is a good segue. So if you have some questions, um, you could ask me about the culture, because I haven't said much about that. Yeah? You said that the, uh, the Roma came up with the Turks as soldiers, and they were taken, then they went into slavery. How did that occur? How did Roma come to be called Turks? Well, you said they, um, they came with the Turks in a military way. Yeah. And then, and then they were enslaved for a while. How? Well, we, we they, they were service providers to the troop. They weren't fighters for the Turks. And we're still working on this aspect of the history. There are a couple of historians in Bulgaria who are examining this. Um, and the question is, might they have been slaves already on the Ottoman side, even before coming into Europe? Uh, we just don't know enough. So they weren't protected by that um, association? No. But what's interesting is that the Romnichal Romanis, that is to say uh, the Romani population in this country who've come here from Britain, and it's a big population, and in fact, a representative will be here on the 5th of May, which is uh, Mario. You'll have to come and listen to him, Mario Williams. The Romnichal word for the Vlach Romanis here is Turks. It's a misnomer, but that's the common word used for them. Yeah. So you want to talk about the culture? <laughs> yeah. I want um, to hear it. That one of the reasons for the barrier between us and y'all is cultural. And it's traceable to India. And it has to do with this notion of ritual purity and ritual pollution. And <clears throat> a lot of books say we don't have a religion. Or if they want to talk about our religion, they say, well, some are Muslims, some are Orthodox Christians, some are Catholics, and so on. But those are all religions picked up from outside. We do have our own religion, but we don't regard it as a religion, because we live it all the time. It's not something saved for Saturday or Sunday. Um, it has to do with maintaining spiritual balance. And the balance is only maintained by living in the right way. And that means how you interact with everything around you, men and women, uh, how you prepare food, how you wash things. Everything has to be done in the right way. And it gets quite complicated. You could have three different bowls for washing three different types of things, clothes, food, uh, bed sheets and so on. If you stray from that behavior, it's like you have a, a seesaw, a teeter-totter. It has to be kept like this. And if you don't live properly, it starts to tip. And once it starts to tip, bad things happen. Bad luck, bad health and so on. You are your behavior is, is watched by what we call mule, which is the spirits of, of dead family and so on. And <clears throat> they kind of guide you. And if you do so, here's an example, example I always use. But we are not supposed to let food or plates or knives and things fall on the floor. You cannot pick them up and wash them off and keep using them. But if you were to do that, then there would be something bad would happen. And it wouldn't be coincidence, it would be, we call Trikaza, it's, it's like retribution, because the mule would be sending you a little message. You understand? Um, from a Romani point of view, that nothing is a coincidence. There's no such thing as coincidence. 
Everything is the result of something else. Now, obviously some Romani families are much stricter about this sort of thing than others. If you, and, and the Vlach people are really strict. If you are not spiritually clean, you can sort of infect other people. If, if you um, don't prepare a meal properly and I eat that meal, I can be contaminated spiritually. I may be squeaky clean. I might have had 10 showers. But, and, and there's different words. Um, there's a, a word that means dirty, which is melalo, but that's dirty with dirt. There's a word that means dirty spiritually, which uh, there are different words, but machadi, uh, machado, uh, marime, different words like that. Um, and gaje, non Romani people, are seen to be unclean, not inherently, but because they don't follow the behavior. If, if a white girl married a Romani boy, she would have to learn how to behave, how to cook, how to do everything, how to behave. And, and then she would be spiritually clean too. And I say a girl marrying a boy because opposite from Jews, for us the descent is through the father. For Jews it's through the mother. If my daughter married a non-Romani boy, she would become the daughter of his family. She'd become his daughter and she would not be seen as Raman. If my son married a non-Ramani girl, she would become my daughter. She wouldn't become Ramani because she wouldn't have the blood, but her children would be seen as Ramani. But it all has to do with this idea of keeping a distance. And for that reason, a lot of conservative Roma in this country won't send the kids to school particularly beyond puberty, because it would mean being in a, in a non-Romani environment, eating food in the cafeteria prepared by Gaje. Uh, it would mean mixed classrooms. It would mean being exposed to cultural values, which sometimes can be completely opposite from Romani ones. Um, I could give you some examples, but I think you get the idea. Yes. Um, I was wondering if the early Roman it was more it was, it was more of a matriarchal culture earlier. <clears throat> and is it more it sounds like is it more patriarchal or is it in egalitarian culture? Where did you get the idea that it was used to be matriarchal? I I just I'm, I'm curious. Well there's the um I don't know, there's the, there's the roots of the cards, you know, like there's the, the, the deck of cards that have kind of come along, and then there's the tarot, and I don't really know, that's what I'm asking you. I mean, I hear different things, and I just like to hear from you. Was there ever a, a, like a more major article? Not really. Although women have the ultimate power, in a way, <laughs> because they, they can <coughs> pollute a man, there are certain times when a, a woman is seen as uh, in an unclean state and is therefore in a position to defile a man. And in that respect, she could use that to, to get her own way, and some, some wives do. Um, what would the unclean state be? Well, menstruation, childbirth. If, this, if there were Roma in this room, and I know there's one or two Tiyerti San Madrid, I couldn't talk about menstruation and stuff. All of that's taboo in mixed company. But I know you all don't mind about it. The, the Latin answers, would they be some group that, when you said they went to the exterior, are the Latin answers Roma? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question about the Latin 
The blocks that are in Bulgaria, are they Roman? Yes. Well, or I, that's a good question. Vlach is kind of a confusing term because there's a kind of Romanian <coughs> population who are called Vlach. And that's usually spelled V-L-A-C-H. Mm -hmm and they're in Greece and Bulgaria and so on, but they're Romanian. The, the ones we call Vlach, we, we use a, the Romani spelling, which is V-L-A-X, and we use an X for Ch. Yeah. I live in San Francisco near Union Square, and there's a restaurant down there on Post Street called Zingari, mm -hmm. which is the Italian um, word that mm -hmm. they use for gypsies. Um, and I called the restaurant to try to explain to him uh, the, the owner, so that this was insulting, and he went through a long sort of trope about how the restaurant wants to pick from different parts of Italy and sort of wander around Italy, you know, in, in the cuisine sense. And I tried to explain to him that was also insulting. But he he was originally from from India, this this owner, oh. and he said that the word zinga sounds really similar to a word in his language, hmm. which means like like spark of flame, uh, like like when you first fall in love, like def different applications you can use for this, but. He was, he was trying to make it a positive term, but I was trying to explain to him in Italian, it's like the equivalent of the N-word in our, in our you know, um, culture. So could you speak about that, that word in Italian and how it's perceived, used by Italians and perceived by Italian Roma? Well, it, it was one of the early suggestions for the name of the population was that it sounds like an Indian word. And there was an early 18th century map of India with an area called Singania, which got taken out of later editions because somebody, I think, just filled it in just for the sake of it, to make a case. Um, it's just one of these words, Singani, uh, Tsigoina, it's just a variation of all of that. Uh, there is a, a gift shop in Austin where I live, and it's called Gypsy's Treasures. And I called up there one day and I said, why don't you call yourself Zulu's Treasures? She said, well, I'm not a Zulu. I said, but you're not a gypsy either. She said, well, it's because it's light-hearted and everything. And I mean, that, that's... It wouldn't be offensive if people realized that it's in play but the association is seen as real. There's a show that was hugely popular in Britain and became hugely popular here called My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding. You all heard of that? Yeah. It's about Irish people. They are not Roma. But it was so popular and made such a profit for the advertisers that National Geographic has now produced a six-part series about American gypsies. And they have found, and I, I'm ashamed to say this, but they have found an actual Romani family from New York who are the most disgusting, ignorant people. They are, they're just nasty people. They're shunned by, by the Romani population in New York. And they've made themselves available to National Geographic, who have followed them on a fishing trip to Florida, to the mall. And this is going to be broadcast. We're, we're trying so hard to stop it, but it's, it's ended production, and it should be out soon. But once again, it's presenting Roma as figures of fun, really. Exotic, peculiar, Gypsies, and they're going to use gypsy, they're not going to use Roma. And we just cannot stop them. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to try and turn back the tide. Who started using the word gypsy instead of Roma? Well, no, gypsy is the older word. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, Roma is the oldest word because it's always been there. But gypsy um, started being used in English in Elizabethan times. Okay. But it used to be uh, Egyptian, right, right, and then the E dropped off, and there was an apostrophe, and it was Gypsian, which incidentally is probably why gypsy is often spelt with a small g. Mm -hmm. 
because the capital E got lost. But if you ever write it, and we're trying to get rid of the word altogether, but if you do use it, at least give it a proper noun, capital initial letter. Yeah. Do the people that are from Rajasthan who are Roma consider themselves or use that as their their name? What gypsy? Yeah. No, Roma. No, but the word gypsy is used in India for various they're called un unscheduled tribes, or used to be. Um, but this is because of a, uh, a British administrator called Ibbotson in the Punjab, about 1870, and he, he perceived a similarity between nomadic Indian tribes and Roma back in England. <clears throat> and so he gave them this word gypsy. And, and that has led to all kinds of beautiful coffee table books of uh, Indian tent dwellers and so on. However, there are Indian populations who do seem to be related to us historically. And the Banjara trace their descent from the Rajputs, just as we do and they send representatives to our meetings. If you look in that, um, Shani, can you get my book through there? <clears throat> yeah, if you can see that, here is even a newspaper or one of their newspapers called Roma Banjara because they regard themselves as the legitimate Indian relatives of us. So can you see that? It's in Devanagari. But it's Roma Banjara. But certainly there are lots and lots of um, Indian quotes, gypsy groups who have nothing to do with us whatsoever. Yes, uh, you have done extensive research on the origins of the people but has there been the same type of research done on the origins of the gypsy religion that you just described to us? No. No. <clears throat> it's something that uh, Roma don't talk about very much. And it's not seen as religion. It's well, just, it's, ca it's called uh, Romani Pe. It, it, it's called gypsiness. But it's never called religion. But it is. I mean, it has. We believe in uh, Odell and Obeng as God and the devil. There are also a number of Indian deities that are remembered. There's Kali Durga, and there's a pilgrimage in the south of France each year. Um, there are proverbs that talk about Vayu, who is the Hindu god of the wind, and uh, there is. Uh, Maruti and, and um, various other names of Indian deities are remembered even if they're not contextualized. But the actual spiritual beliefs have to do with internal purity and the maintenance <coughs> of cleanliness and that's how you prepare food and how men and women and people and animals and so on. It's, it's complicated. It almost sounds like Taken like the food, like everything else from wherever they, wherever they traveled. Um, some of it sounds Orthodox Jewish. To me. Well, there are similarities. You've got kosher and treif. Right. <coughs> um, so it's separate dishes. And but, but that is, there, there's no direct connection between Roma and Jews, except that both populations being shunned for so long and being kept out when you're not allowed to buy food in stores or, or use water from the town pump, then hygiene becomes a premium, keeping clean. And uh, this, uh, I often think about how Roma and Jews in the concentration camps could maintain religious observance and personal hygiene. It must have been absolute hell. 
And by the way, Roma and Jews were the only two populations in the Holocaust mm -hmm. uh, targeted by the final solution, victims of genocide. And um, the, the fate of Roma in the Holocaust is not so well known because we haven't had the scholars, um, but we are rapidly <coughs> finding out so much more. I got a call from um, a French organization uh, less than a week ago. They had been in Belarus and found 48 killing centers just for Roma that have never been documented. And they interviewed elderly non-Roma who had actually observed the mass killings, the SS and so on. And they've got these testimonies. But all of this kind of stuff has never been in the record. <coughs> but we're beginning to, to fill in the gaps now. And there's an urgency here because the survivors are, are getting old. The example you gave of the onion, do you see is that the same for the music, Roma music? Roma, Romani music is a bit like Romani cuisine. Because of the diaspora, it differs from place to place. You could argue that there are Indian retentions in certain areas. For example, in Spain, there are certainly, in flamenco, there's uh, Karnataka type of thing, hand gestures and so on, and uh, saitas, and, and which seem to have an Indian <coughs> origin. Uh, the classical tradition in Hungary, um, you have the Bhairava scale, the 12 note chromatic scale, which is Indian. Um, and there are other things. I talk about them in here. There's the uh, Pilevani wrestling. You know about this, where the men cover themselves in oil and wrestle. <laughs> and then there's uh, stick fighting and there's snake charming you can find amongst Roma in, in the Balkans. Those kinds of things are little uh, legacies from India. But the music, I have uh, a colleague who is examining certain kinds of Romani music. And generally, the, the Balkan type has been, uh, the style has been attributed to the Turkish style. He argues, of course, he's an Indian. So he's arguing that even the Islamic Middle Eastern style was introduced to the Muslims by the Indians in the first place. And certain instruments, like a zurna, for example, have their origins in Indian instruments. But uh, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. Um, the ritual purity, even in India, even today, in North and South, we have ritual purity. That's all that's all concerned. So it's not necessary that was absorbed from so you may have come up with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I prefer to think that it, everybody's contributed, you know. Even Indian food, northern Indian food, has a Mughal origin that we think of Indian. Anyway. <laughs>